Hey, welcome to Pure Heart Church's online campus service on your time because we believe that whether it's morning or whether it's night or whether you're heading to work or whether you're hanging out at home, we always have time to build and grow in our relationship with God, especially when we're talking about topics like the one we're dealing with today, and that's love. And you go, well, I know what love is. That's, that's probably, I probably got that in the bag. I probably got that figured out. But we're going through this series of what love actually is. And sometimes it's a helpful approach to kind of look at what something is not to actually more clearly define and understand what it is. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today is what are some things that love is, but also some of the things that love is not. Welcome to church.
Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend. We wanna give a special shout out to Crossroads Recovery. We love you guys. We are so honored to walk with you on your journey with Jesus. Well, this is week three of our series titled Love Is. And I started thinking this week about how music, poetry, literature have tried to define for us the intricacies of this thing called love. Perhaps nothing has been written about, pondered, and sung about more than love. So let's take a little look at what love is. Great American philosopher Johnny Cash said, love is a burning thing. Shakespeare said, love is smoke made with the fume of sighs. Poet Robert Frost said, love is an irresistible desire to be irresistibly desired. In the Canterbury Tales, Chaucer told us love is blind. H.L. Mencken pontificated that love is like war, easy to begin, but very hard to stop. And there's one of the great Saturday night shows from my childhood that said love is exciting and new. Come aboard, we're expecting you. Hans and Anna from Frozen let us know that love is an open door. John Lennon said, love is a promise. Love is a souvenir. Once given, never forgotten, never let it disappear. And in that same thread, the Beatles said, love is old, love is new. Love is all, love is you. And Pat Benatar said, love is a battlefield. And according to Fleetwood Mac, love is dangerous. Amy Winehouse mused that love is a losing game, while E.E. E. Cummings said it is the voice under all silences. Captain and Tennille told the 1970s that love will keep us together. And then one of my favorites, Randy Travis, said love is deeper than the holler. And the legendary Forrest Gump admitting, I'm not a smart man, but I know what love is. Now, listen, we could go on and on, but this idea of love captivates us. And just when we think we have a grasp on it, defining love remains elusive, and here's why. We think love starts with us, that it's a feeling that comes from within, and that's why so often it just love just seems like this roller coaster going up and down with the situations and the moods of life. And you know, even in the church, we talk about it. We, we think we know what it is. And then we look at passages like our passage that we're anchoring this series in, in 1 Corinthians 13. But we don't realize that in the original language of the New Testament, there were actually four different words for love. There was one was stergo, which is love within a, a family. It's, it's kind of that parental love. And then there was eros, which would, we would get our word erotic from that and talking about how it's love that is passionate and desires an object. And then there was phileo love, which is brotherly love. You think about Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And then finally, there was agape which is defined as self-sacrificial love. It's interesting that among these four words, it was the least known and most rarely used, which was agape, which is the one that Paul chose to describe God's infinite love to the Corinthian Christ followers who were struggling to live out their faith in a pagan culture. See, th this little word agape not only describes God's love, it's the love that challenges us today as followers of Jesus in our own world to express a love that is self-sacrificial and others-oriented. By using agape, Paul did something unique. He's painting a picture that had never been used before in the Greek language. Paul was creating an entirely new way of thinking. Nobody had seen this before. And if you're in the, the church there at Corinth and you're, you're listening to this being read or, or maybe you're reading it for the very first time that about this idea of agape, your, your mind would have been blown. And Paul describes it, says love, agape is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It's not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking is not irritable and does not keep a record of wrongs. 
Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Okay, so we read this and we say, oh, there it is. That's it. That's what love is. Definition sealed. You know what? Really, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. So what we're going to do in this message this weekend, we're going to break this down. But before 1 Corinthians chapter 13, obviously comes chapter 12. And at the end of chapter 12, Paul is talking about how the body of Christ, the church, functions as a community of faith. Now, I would submit we can't fully understand what love is and move toward that definition unless we understand how Paul builds up to it in 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 27. Let's look at this together. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and different kinds of tongues. And then Paul asks a series of rhetorical questions to get them thinking about this. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Of course, the answer to that is no. Everybody doesn't do all of those things. And then he said there in verse 31, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Now, let, let me pause just for a second here and see if I can illustrate this section like this. Over the, the last four years, I have spent a significant amount of time coaching other pastors. I've had the privilege of coaching pastors, coaching churches, and helping them get from where they are to where, where they ultimately want to be. And with that, I've had to be on airplanes quite a bit, probably more than I wanted to be. But I got to be honest with you guys, the best thing about flying a lot is gaining status on, on the airlines. It's really interesting because once you get status, when you fly a certain amount of miles or you accumulate a certain amount of points, they they tier it. And so with my airline of choice, and I'm, I say this with the most humility, okay, I have reached the second highest level of status with my airline of choice. And I'm telling you, that is the only way to travel. I mean, not only do you get um, free luggage, you know, check-in and things like that, you get priority check-in, the bags come out first, you get priority choice of seating, and there's just a different level. You get to board early in the process, which you know now everybody, they don't wanna check bags anymore because it's too expensive, so they're carrying stuff on and that overhead space fills up so fast. So you know, getting on early is a good thing. And so flying status is, is great, but there's, a, there's kind of a pecking order that comes with this because like I said, I'm the second highest status. I was traveling with a buddy of mine and he's actually reached the highest status on our airline of choice. And he was boarding ahead of me in group one and I was in group two. Snarky guy gets on board, he's going out ahead of me and he turns around, looks at me and says, yeah, keep working group two. It's like, okay, yeah, whatever. So there's kind of a little arrogance that comes with the status that you get. Now, why do I bring this up? Because in essence, the Corinthian church viewed the gifts of the Holy Spirit as spiritual status. That somehow, whatever gift they had, it made them spiritually superior to others in the church who didn't have their status. It's like, okay, I, you know, I speak with tongues. It, Keep working, group two. You know, keep try to try to get where I'm at. So, in essence, here's here's what was happening. Let me cut to the chase here. They were looking out. Don't miss this. They were looking out more for themselves and their own status in life than they were for the good of others. And let me say this to you: any spiritual gifting that we possess, ladies and gentlemen, it's it's not for us, as we like to say here at Pure Heart. It's for the sake of others. Now, I want to revisit verse 31. This is critical. Paul says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Paul's saying, go for it. Seek them. Ask the Holy Spirit to gift you with this, but not for the sake of spiritual status, but as we like to say around pure heart, for the sake of others. And then right in that same sentence, Paul drops this just gem of a verse. He said, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. 
the most excellent way. We're talking about a way beyond measure, a way that far surpasses anything else. So that's the end of chapter 12. And then, of course, we know that chapter and verse breaks were not built into the original text when Paul was writing. He breaks into what's now chapter 13, and he starts expounding on the most excellent way, the way of love. I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, love is the most excellent way of life. Bar none. Paul says, hey, If you want to choose a way of life that just goes above and beyond and supersedes everything else, he says, I want you to choose the most excellent way. Now, my maternal grandparents had a profound influence on my life in my early years, especially. I spent a lot of time with them. I learned so much from them, not only about our own family history, but also about them personally. Now, they both died in 2004, but I still have a lot of memories, specifically from my grandmother, who was the consummate busybody. I mean, this lady wanted to know everything about everybody, and there was a reason behind that. She wanted to know so that she could freely gossip about them. And I'm not exaggerating. When I say freely gossip, I mean, we're talking like out in the open. And this played out in really interesting fashion. I mean, for example... Uh, they came up with code names for people, secret names that only my grandparents knew so that whenever they were out in the yard or somewhere else, they could freely gossip about the people. And if they happened to overhear them, those people would never know who they were talking about. Now, it's interesting. I remember this. Things stick out when you're a kid. They named their next door neighbors Pucker and Satchel. I'm not making this up. Now, there's reasons for those names, which... I can't share publicly, but as I got older, I found it puzzling because they would go to such great lengths to gossip. They genuinely wanted to know about people and their life. Now, I digress a little bit, but let me move into something else here. One of my grandma's catchphrases when she was talking about people that she was a busybody with, trying to learn everything about their life, one of her catchphrases was, oh, he's got good ways. Or she's got good ways, or he don't have good ways, or she don't have good ways. Now, what grandma meant was that from her perspective, the way they lived their lives revealed their true heart and their true character. In other words, their external ways were indicative of an internal reality. See, our ways reveal what's in our heart, the way we treat our spouse, the way we treat our children, the way we interact with our friends and coworkers. What kind of employee are we? How about the way we handle money, the way we approach our job, the way we live out what we say we believe? All of those things are indicative of what's inside our heart. And Paul is telling us here in our anchor text that the most excellent way that we can live life is to walk in God-honoring, self-sacrificial, others-centered love. Walking in this most excellent way of love separates us, Paul says, from the way of clanging gongs and noisy symbols of a world that is nothing but self-directed and self-centered. God wants us desperately to find this way and walk in this most excellent way. Even centuries before this, the psalmist declared, God, you make known to me the path of life. You're you're gonna show me how to live. You're gonna fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Now you're listening to this message and some may ask, well, well, how do do I do this? I I can't do it. I I can't walk in this way just on my own doings. And you know what? If that's how you're thinking, you're absolutely right. Because any capacity that we have to walk in the most excellent way comes from outside ourselves. And here's why. Because love comes from the nature and character of God. It begins and originates With God. John the Apostle expounds on this in his first letter, chapter four, starting in verse seven. Dear friends, let us love 
one another. That's agape again. Let us agape one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now watch this. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. Knowing God who is love, ladies and gentlemen, is the only way. Say it again. Knowing God who is love, his nature, his character, it's the only way that you and I can truly walk in love. And I'm told there in, in, in the Bible, in, in, in John's writings, if I don't love, I don't know God. Now, that, that sounds harsh. We say, oh, that's, that's restricting. No, on the contrary, it's really true and liberating because it lets me know that I don't have to manufacture it. I don't have to conjure it up on my own or try to find it. It comes to me just by virtue of me knowing God. You see, as we grow and we move progressively closer to God through this vital relationship, what happens is his character and his nature grow in our lives. His love grows in us. See, there can be no real and growing knowledge of God, which is not expressed in a growing love for others. It will become a natural overflow of us living life in loving union with him. So, okay, I, I get that. Love comes from God. We've got, we've got to know God. We've got to grow. How does God express his character and his nature? And how can we find that most excellent way? I'm glad you asked. We keep reading. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we love God, watch this, but that he loved us. Remember that in John 3, God so loved the world that he gave? Well, John brings it up again here. He loved us and he sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. Write this down if you're taking notes this weekend. The nature and character of God is revealed in Jesus. We see that clearly in the scripture. So love comes from God, but this nature and character of love that's in God is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Real love is expressed in the reality that God, out of his character and nature, loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die the death we deserve to die so that we can live the life we don't deserve to live. And when we receive this love through Christ, watch this, it gives us the capacity to love others in the same way. How is that? We're told in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, that the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. So if the nature of love is God and it is who he is and he expresses that love to us in Jesus is all the fullness of God. That's why Jesus was able to say, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Now you see how this is all connecting together? God who said he would make known to us the path of life, the, the way of life, if you will, the more excellent way, God has done just that in the person of Jesus, who is the perfect embodiment of the character and nature of God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then when we start walking in his way, as the way, the truth, and the life, we abide in him, as John 15 says. You know what we're doing? We are walking the path of life. We're receiving God's love. And then as we love others, as that love flows through us to others, God's love is made complete in us. Now, let me see if I can bring all of this together for you. We're talking about what love is. So here's my definition based on what love is and what we're looking at in all of this today. Love is a way of life rooted in the nature and character of God expressed in Christ through us toward all. That's our challenge. That's what the challenge is for us. That's what Paul's calling us to. He says, I want you to live this more excellent way. 
It comes from the nature and character of God. It's expressed in Christ, the person of Christ. We come to know him. We walk his way. His love comes through us. We extend it toward all. And you know, the first followers of Jesus, they understood this. In fact, the first followers of Jesus, they weren't even called Christians. Christian was a term that was placed on the followers of Jesus by outsiders probably 15 to 20 years after Christ ascended to heaven. And the reality is it was not a term of endearment. It it, it was almost condescending because it means little Christs. The first followers of Jesus, get this, they didn't call themselves Christian. They called themselves the way because they knew above everything else, following Jesus is not just a confession It's not just a belief, but following Jesus is a way of life. It's a group of people who have said yes to the way, the truth, and the life, and they've committed themselves to live and to walk in the way of Jesus, the full embodiment of a God who is love. For these first followers of Jesus, love was their defining mark, not just among themselves, but among non-believers. And this went beyond even the first Christians. We, we see it extending even into the centuries following the launch of the church. There, there's a letter that was written to a Roman pagan named Diognetus in the second century that emphasizes how love was the defining mark of Christians. Watch this. Describing Christians, he says, they dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are lacking in all things, but yet they abound in all. A philosopher named Aristides wrote to the Roman emperor Hadrian, also in the second century, and he said this, again, describing Christians. They walk in all humility and kindness. Falsehood is not found among them, and they love one another. Now, this love that we're talking about was their defining mark, and it was demonstrated in so many ways. We know from history that the first three centuries saw many plagues sweep through the Roman Empire, killing a high percentage of the population. And Christians during that time became known for their exceptional care of those affected by the plagues, demonstrating a love and compassion that had never before been seen. It's recorded that Christians visited the sick fearlessly, ministered to them continually, with many ultimately losing their lives to disease themselves. See, this spirit of self-sacrifice exemplified Jesus' command to love others, even at great personal risk. The care that these Christians provided in these times of crisis didn't go unnoticed. People noticed this, and it helped reshape the public perception of Christianity and even attracted converts. People were drawn to the fringes of the community of Christianity. So you know what? There's something that they have that I want to be a part of. There's something about them. And you know what it was? It was the way that they loved. I have to wonder, what would happen in our culture in 2024 if love once again became the defining mark of Christians? What if we followed a way of love that demonstrated the very character and nature of the one who is love? The first followers of Jesus loved others. Why? Because they were born of God. They took on his very nature. And we have to ask ourselves, what would it look like if we followed the more excellent way? And that's what Paul challenges us to do. Most of you are familiar with the Ten Commandments, and I'm I'm not going to take a lot of time to break this down. But if you look at the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. It's, It's vertical. But the last six show us how to act toward others. They're they're more horizontal. And and really, that's what Paul does here in 1 Corinthians 13. The first few characteristics of love that we find in this passage, they anchor love in the character and nature of God, who is love. And then the rest show us how to demonstrate that character in a loving way. Okay, so now that we know where love comes from, how it's expressed, the challenge of us to follow that way, let's look at what Agape love, the more excellent way is. Check this out. Love is patient, 
kind, not envious, not boastful, not arrogant. Now, as you look at that initial list, I think that's the God that we serve. The God that we serve, from whom love comes, is patient. It's interesting because patient is not used as an adjective to describe love. Patient is a verb, and it's speaking of a state of being. Paul says God's character is patient and long-suffering. We see this even back in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 34, the Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. So if we love, patience is the result which comes about because we're modeling the character of a God who is patient. And and, and just keeping it real with you guys, I'm not there yet. I battle with patience. God is always seemingly putting me in position where I have to exercise patience. Just one quick example, you know, I'm the guy that if I'm at the grocery store and I'm moving towards the front, I start scanning the checkout lines. And I'm trying to find which one is the shortest. And even if I find the shortest one, inevitably I get behind the scanner that's not working or the customer whose debit card won't scan the right way or their coupons aren't working or there's an issue that's going on. And I'm just like, what is going on here? And it's patience. I battle with it. But yet love is patient. Love is also kind. Why? Because God is kind. God performs acts of kindness because kindness is in his nature. His loving kindness, David said, Psalm 63, is better than life. And it is his kindness that leads us to repentance. All of these acts of kindness flow from who he is. That's why we can say love is kind. Now, I want to challenge us on something here. The character of kindness can't be achieved. It's got to be inherited. It's the direct result of a firsthand encounter with God's personal kindness as our soul is transformed by him. I mean, think about it. No matter how many acts of kindness I perform, my actions don't guarantee that I'm a kind person. Doesn't guarantee that I have kindness rooted in my soul. You see, kindness reflects the character of God. And when I'm anchored to him, his kindness, which is in his nature, comes to me and I can extend that same kindness to others. Love is patient. Love is kind. Watch this. Love is not envious, boastful, or arrogant. Now, why would Paul tell us what love is not? Well, basically, he's telling us, look, there's never a circumstance in which love is envious. Never a circumstance where it's boastful or arrogant. Why? Because there's never a circumstance in which God is envious, boastful, or arrogant. Love is always guarding and protecting. It's it's willing to give itself up to protect the greater purpose of demonstrating to others. That's why it's never self-seeking or envious, as some translations would say. Love is never boastful. Doesn't he praise on itself? You know why? Because you can't love and boast at the same time. Well, how's that, John? You see, boasting is about us. Love is about others. And it's interesting, but I cannot find in the Gospels where Jesus was ever about himself. He was always about others, even the night before his crucifixion, when we see that he humbled himself, girded himself in a towel, and washed the feet of the disciples in the room. Love doesn't boast. And love is never arrogant. Arrogance supports pride. Pride and arrogance work together, but arrogance is an internal attitude. You know what arrogance says? Arrogance says, I'm glad I'm not like you. I'm glad I'm not like them. Love says, you and I are the same, right to the core. Love replaces animosity with identity. Love sees that God's rule is the only rule and that my role is the role of a servant. So now after showing us what God is like, patient, kind, not not boastful, not arrogant, not envious, all those things, Paul moves toward the outward demonstration of love. Based on a God who is patient, kind, never envious, boastful, or arrogant, we live it out like this. We anchor our lives in the way of Jesus and demonstrate the most excellent way. Here we go. This love that we demonstrate, it's not rude. 
is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to only focus on the last two as we conclude our time together. Paul said, love's not irritable, and love does not keep a record of wrongs. Here's what that means. It means love is not provoked, and love forgives. Those two things work together. Love is not provoked, and love forgives. Imagine, if you will, with me today, a courtroom. The accused is on the stand, and the prosecutor has all the evidence, and the prosecutor is just railing, painting the accused as a liar, shame, malicious, and evil, and the evidence is, is, is compelling, it's vindictive, it's spiteful, and it's intended to bring the jury to a guilty verdict where they will call for a punishment of the accused. Now, this entire scene is only focused on one thing, and that is revenge. But as you picture this court scene, picture the accused staying silent, saying nothing, offering no defense, no rebuttal. The accused does not try to justify, explain, or proclaim innocence. The accused simply absorbs what is thrown upon him, gathering the insults and indignities into himself without a single attempt to rebuke his accusers. And then all of a sudden, much to the shock of the courtroom, the accused who has said nothing up to this point speaks. And in his speech, he turns aside the revenge of the crowd deflects all the hate, and simply says, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Love is not provoked. Love forgives. Do you, do you know what I just described to you is, in essence, what Jesus did when he was on the earth? Jesus demonstrated the meaning of love not being provoked. We're told in scripture he stood silent before his accusers. When, when he knew that his very life was on the line, he stood silent. In his self-sacrifice, Jesus showed nothing but love and forgiveness. And when he was on the cross after being tortured and nailed to the cross to die, to release humanity from the penalty of sin and the sting of death, Jesus is on that cross and he looks across the crowd and he speaks finally after being silent and says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Why was he able to do this? Because Jesus was the full expression of God. God who is love was in the person of Jesus while he was on trial for his life, while he was being beaten and tortured, while he was being nailed to a cross, while he was suspended between earth and heaven. It was the love of the Father that was in him. And this love does not respond with resentment or irritability or bitterness or anger. No, no, no. With Jesus, love is about mercy. It matters most, ladies and gentlemen, that God's love was demonstrated to us in this way. And for us, here's what I would challenge us on as we're trying to live out love in the way of Jesus. It doesn't matter that love stands in a pathway of accusation. You know what love does? Love prays for its enemies. Love turns the other cheek. Love absorbs the slings and the arrows of others. And most importantly, love forgives. Even when forgiving, <laughs> seems like the last thing to do, love does not become provoked. And, and I have to ask myself as I'm, as I'm thinking through this, it's like, God, is that, is that my life? When things come at my life that would make me want to rise up in defense, am I, am I able to absorb the blows that come my way? Now, this doesn't mean that we're, we're just supposed to be a doormat and allow every person to walk on us. No, no, there's accountability that happens here. But you know what? We don't have to hold people accountable. God is the one that holds people accountable. And sometimes absorbing the hurt, absorbing the pain, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. And extending forgiveness to those who have wronged us, not the easiest thing to do. But that is the life to which we are called. That is the way of love. That is the more excellent way 
And I, for one, am glad that Jesus modeled it for us. I, I can't model this on my own, but as I look to him, as I allow his life to become my life, the love of God, which is in Christ, now comes to me and works through me for the benefit and for the sake of others. I want to live that kind of life. And Jesus gives us the capacity to do that. And you might be watching this this weekend and you're watching this and you're thinking, you know what, I, I've not yet said yes to Jesus. And that for you is the starting point. You're trying to figure out how to walk in the way of love. Start there, start with Jesus. Start by asking him to be the Lord of your life and to lead your life from this moment forward. And in just a minute, we're gonna pray. And if this is you, if you've never said yes to Jesus, or maybe you're gonna say yes to him as a rededication of your life because you realize, hey, I wanna walk the more excellent way. Well, God wants that for you as well. And the way that we walk the excellent way is by allowing our lives to come into alignment with Jesus. When we do that, his love works in us so that we can walk it out towards others. So I invite you to pray this prayer with me in your own words, knowing that God hears you. Lord Jesus, I thank you today that you came to earth to demonstrate the love of God the character and the nature of love which is in God, I know today is in Jesus. And he demonstrated that love in the way that while we were yet sinners, he died for me. And I thank you for that, that you opened up the possibility for me to walk in the more excellent way. So today I ask you to forgive my sins. I ask you to be the Lord of my life and lead my life from this moment forward. Today I say yes to you, to your way, and I ask that you'd help me to walk in that way so that I can truly live it out and demonstrate your love, the same that you've extended to me to demonstrate that love toward others. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching this weekend. God bless you. So wasn't that great to be able to look at some things that God's love is, but some of the things that God's love also is not. I think sometimes we can muddle those up and get them a bit confused, but man, if we can experience truly God's love from him, then truly it can pour out to others. How can we love others without God's love in us first? If you then accepted Christ today, you said, God, I want you in me. I want you to be a part of my life. I need forgiveness of sins. We would love to walk with you on that journey. Go to pureheart.org slash handraise so we can give you some next steps. Also, we believe that showing the tangible love of Christ, like I said, God's love flows into us so we can flow out to others. We wanna do that in our community, be a part of showing his love to them. Check this out. Here at Family, we oftentimes ask, as you know, the question, if we were gone tomorrow, would we be missed? We do a lot of work with 11 different partnering schools. Several of those schools are in at-risk communities, serving kids and families that are in challenging situations. Recently, we did a career day at a school that turned out to be an amazing blessing to that school, the children, and the families. I want you to hear a little bit more from the principal of that school as to what that impact really looked like. My name is Principal Tara Burnaby, and we are here today at Harold W. Smith Elementary School at our annual career day. This is our second time hosting volunteers here with our 750 students and 40 teachers and 30 classified staff members, just hearing all about various careers that students are interested in. Here at Harold W. Smith, we are a Kids at Hope campus. That means we teach our students to see themselves in a pathway of success, not just academically, but also in careers and community service. So events like this one are super important for our students to be able to make that time traveling more concrete and be able to start answering the question of, where do I see myself when I grow up? Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do this without you. So Pure Heart family, thank you again for your amazing, consistent giving. It's your giving that helps us continue to have an impact in the community around us. God bless you. I love that we're able to go and care for kids, show them God's love and say, hey, we wanna redirect you. We wanna be part of lifting up kids in struggling communities because what could God do with their lives? We know that's what God does with each and every one of us. He lifts us up and then moves us forward with a mission, with a vision. If you wanna give into the vision of Pure Heart and you go, these are the types of things I also care about, I wanna support. You can do that by going to pureheart.org give 
or in the Pure Heart app. We're so thankful for each and every one of you that gives into this mission that allows us to continue to do the work of loving and caring for our community, our world, and things like trauma, mental health, schools. It's so, so important. If you missed last week's message, go ahead and click the link below. I heard so many people, staff during our staff meeting, my wife when she came home, people coming out of church that said, that was a message I needed to hear, but it also challenged me. We love you guys, and we'll see you next week.